everybody. Week 11 shoot. Very nice to have you. Um, I am really hoping I don't drop out tonight. Uh, I have bought myself a new webcam. The webcam I had was about eight years old and I think that was my problem. Uh, but there's been a whole heap of stuff that's been going on with my computer, which um, I've seen the blue screen of death many times this week. I think I have to go shopping. So I'm just going to warn you in advance. I think four warned is four armed. Um, I see Sigrid. It looks like you're in, you've got some mood lighting thing going on. You, are you, you, you're, um, you're, you're muted at the moment, but I don't know if somebody smeared Vaseline on your lens or, or you're just looking particularly calm and beautiful today, but mm -hmm. it's quite funny. I think it's the sun coming in through the window behind me. So uh, I have not sat here in daylight before. Mm, well, so Rita, Rita, our friend Rita here, she's from Perth. So we might need to explain daylight savings to her. <laughs> um, okay. I should have done all of this stuff before I turn the recording on, right? I'm getting caught out. Okay. Um, people who desperately want daylight savings, but because everybody <laughs> lives in WA is 85. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, it's, yeah, it's just that time of year. Actually, this time of year is when it's not too unreasonable for people on this side of the country to p talk to people at your side of the country, isn't it? No, actually, I, th I find it makes it harder. Oh, harder for you, just easier for us. Yeah, actually, that's probably true. Easier for everybody else, but just harder for me. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, anyway. Well, look. It's lovely to see you all. This is not the last one. Um, I'm more than happy to keep going as we head into exam time. Um, now, for the face-to-face -face students among us, I believe that you might have had another email saying that your exam time is going to change. Do you, are you aware of that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's saying it's in the evening now. And it's going to be, I believe it should be the same day, but somewhere on campus that evening. Okay, uh, I'm flying out the next day, so my uh, intention is to show up afterwards to collect the exams uh, so that I can mark them on time. Uh, for those of you at OUA, you're right at the other end of the exam time spectrum. Um, yours is some weeks afterwards, isn't it? It's about... Yeah, this um, isn't until the 12th. Are you going to be back before then? Yep. Okay. I'm going to be around. I'm actually not that hard to catch even when I'm awake. I've turned my light on and I feel like I'm just brightening. It's too bright. It's actually annoying me. But I thought it would be nice to have a light. Is that better? Oh, now I'm blue. Oh, now I just look old. Maybe I'll just turn it off. We'll be fine. Um, I am old. I, I just have to deal with that. Um, I, I'm, again, if you need to contact me, I, I will be overseas. I think I'll go back on the 10th. Um, and I'm leaving the day after your exam. I'm leaving the Wednesday of that week. I think that's the 30th. Your exam's 29th, something like that. Maybe I'm leaving the 29th. Your exam's 28th. Please don't listen to me for dates. I'm pretty sure I'm leaving on a Wednesday. Um, and your exam's on the Tuesday. Um, I have WhatsApp. So I will not have, I do not have a roaming SIM, but I have WhatsApp, which is a pretty easy way to contact me. I think I also have Viber. I have Skype. They all come to me. I have email um, and I will possibly have a cocktail in my hand at some point. But other than that, I should be relatively easy to catch if you want to talk to me. You guys can also talk to each other. Um, you can, we have, we will have the chutes on the Sunday nights uh, and I'm very happy to just continue showing up at about this time if people want to talk to me. I also have the times that are available uh, where you can go and book a time for me at, with me um, and have a 15 minute Zoom meeting or you can say that you would prefer to do that over the phone or whatever, it's fine. So what are we gonna do today? Uh, my, I, I've got a little game for us to play because I think we're now in let's get ready for exam mode. So let's put everybody under a little bit of pressure to try and come up with an answer and write something quickly. Uh, so I have um, a kind of quiz game that's designed to do that. Uh, but I am also happy to just talk about specific questions that you might have first. 
So as always, is there a question or something that people would like to throw in the ring? Yes, I have a question. <laughs> oh, that's unlike you, Rita. Good. Yeah. She has good questions. You want to hear her questions. Um, in terms of exam responses, <clears throat> let's say, for example, there's a scenario and um, there's no contract because of an issue with um, offer and acceptance. Do we then have to go on and say, but if I'm wrong about that, no, we could just... Look, if it's, um, if it's ambiguous and if you think it could go either way, then you want to go on. Okay. But effectively, in exams, you're trying to be as efficient as you possibly can. Um, and, and I'm going to go through tomorrow night. I think it's unfair to go through here where we always have such a smaller group, but I am prepared for tomorrow night to basically walk you through what the exam will look like um, in broad terms. Um, and it's going to be in some ways quite similar to last semester's exam, which you can't even see yet. Um, it will be on, it'll be available from, actually I'll probably put it up after we do this. Um, make it available but there's been a slight change from last semester where um, previously what was happening is you know you just went into the exam and you did whatever was there from last semester and this semester it'll happen again I'm going to give you a contract in advance so you're going to have a draft a document to look at now last semester I got to give a scenario as well so we could have quite a complex scenario and then there were kind of the questions related to the scenario. So even though, uh, you know, everybody sort of walked in with a broad scenario and a contract agreement, you know, there were lots of different questions on it. It was the same contract as it will be this time and scenario for both the OUAs and face to faces. But then when you walked in, there were lots of different questions. So, um, and my logic behind doing that is that, um, You've got two hours for 50%. It's just, it's just mean. <laughs> it's just a really mean kind of way of assessing where you guys are up to. And what was happening, I found, is most people did fine, but very few people did brilliantly because, and uh, Sigrid's a teacher, so she's probably got more input on this than I do. But the thing I found really difficult to do, Sigrid, as a, as a teacher, was find a problem that was, easy enough that it was uh, appropriate that, you know, anybody who was competent could get it right. So it was testing whether you were right or wrong, but hard enough that the people who are brilliant can shine. It was very difficult to get that. So everybody was just doing okay. <laughs> so again, by giving you something in advance, um, and in, unfortunately they won't let me do the scenarios. We've tried it once, but anyway. Uh, so you're going to get, uh, an example contract. So the questions will relate to the document that you're given in some way. So you're not under this enormous pressure of uh, trying to read something complex, particularly as for OUA, you only get 10 minutes reading time. Face-to-face uh, -face get 15 minutes reading time. Um, but during the reading time, you cannot lift up a pen. So actually a longer time is in many ways more stressful in a shorter time. Uh, so, so basically the way, I said I wasn't gonna do this until tomorrow, I know I've sort of started, but basically there will be around seven, somewhere between six and eight anyway, uh, questions that relate in some way to this sort of key scenario. And for the one you've got this coming semester, <laughs> it will be alternatives. So the same characters will be involved. I'll tell you now because it, you might feel like it's procrastinating researching. All the characters in this exam come from The Simpsons. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, I don't think that's gonna help you or hinder you in any way. Uh, and the characters there, you'll have alternative scenarios. So in scenario one, uh, you know, uh, in fact, our key, I'll tell you in advance, the key characters in this are Mr. Apu, who runs the local store, and Lisa Simpson, and Nelson Muntz. Don't know why I picked him, but I did. Um, and in one scenario, Lisa might be buying something. In the next one, it'll be all incredibly similar that Nelson is trying to buy something. 
And that, so they're all alternatives. They don't build on each other. They're just alternatives. You start from scratch each time. Uh, and so each time you're basically giving me as much as you can about the answer. It's about focusing in on the, uh, the actual, the key issue. And because, and it is, it's, it's marked using Iraq. They're very similar to in complexity to the kinds of problems you've been dealing with if you've been doing them in the discussion board tasks. So they're not, you know, they've got room for you to grow, um, but they're not, they're not as nearly as complex as the big assignment tasks that you've had. You know, they're little ones and they're designed so that you can go use Iraq. So you can say, okay, this is what the key issue is and you're rewarded for identifying this issue is more important than that issue. So again, if you're trying to scattergun and tell me everything that you know about contract law in each one, you will run out of time and you won't be well rewarded for being able to identify what the issues are. That's a long winded answer to a short question, isn't it? I really liked it because it addressed <laughs> many other questions that I probably would have had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and so, so to hang, hang tight for tomorrow, I will go through it. I will also make last year's, so last year's scenario and exam uh, like the two of them, so there's a face-to-face -face and an OUA one, I'll make both of them available to you. So you've got a quite a good sense, I think, of how this kind of scenario will work. Um, and you guys will be fine. Um, I'm on recording, so I shouldn't say that, but particularly those of you who are showing up here today for this, because you are, on the whole, you've been doing the, the extra um, assessment tasks, You've been showing up, you've been asking questions. Um, and, but again, overall, for those of you who are watching me on a recording now, I'm not worried about any of you either because this is a strong group. Um, yeah. So your challenge will be to stand out in a strong group. Any other questions? Um, I have a, an anonymous question about whether Nelson and Lisa will be under the age of 18. Um, unless uh, you, the short answer is no, but the, um, the facts should make that clear. Um, but they might not like, yeah, the fact you, you'll need to make assumptions about uh, their age, um, but it should be relatively clear when that's a relevant assumption. Okay, well, do you guys want to play a game? Let's do that. Um, I'm going to bring up my slide pad. Um, now, I've never watched this show, which is unusual for me because I am, as you probably worked out, completely addicted to television. Um, but this, uh, this uh, game that we're playing is based on the TV show Jeopardy. Um, have any of you played or watched that? Just let me, I'm just going to find where my uh, controls are so I can, uh, there it is, share. And we're going to share that. So the way Jeopardy works um, is, oh, and clearly I need to refresh because I went to just check that the slide pack was working and looked at the first question, the certainty link. So I've just picked um, four particular areas that we haven't, they're areas where we did them pretty quickly. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody felt that we've dealt with them in a fairly robust way. Um, and in each, we've got five questions. Plus, we've got a wild card area, which could be from anywhere in the course, a bit like your exam, right? They're wild cards. Um, and so the way that it works is, in theory at least, doesn't always follow through. Uh, the lower the point score, the more, uh, the, the easier the question is. Um, but basically, you pick an area, pick a question, you get to answer it. Uh, if somebody else answers it correctly and you don't, we'll move across to that person. And um, so you can't do a harder question to add points until you've done, you've, you've uh, started. So, so if whoever goes first will get to pick a question 
Um, and then when that question's done, so just say I went first and I did the certainty question for 10 points, the next person can either do a certainty question for 20 points or they could do one of the other topics for the lower point number. Make sense? Yep. I have to look down now to see whether you agree with me or not. Um, I am going to suggest that we take it in turns, that you have a go at answering the question, um, but the rest of you, while we're using the thinking music time, will quickly bash out into the comments because your practice answer. And then you can share that. And if somebody gives a better answer, we'll give them the points. Are you feeling comfortable with a level of competition between you all? Not at all, says Sigrid. So I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable, right? There's, so you don't have to do it this way. Um, we can just talk about them one by one. I do have a notepad if somebody wants to keep the questions going, but um, I reckon you guys are all up for it. Um, I've just put your photos on my screen in front of the thing. Can, is that disturbing you? Can you guys, are you guys seeing yourselves or just the screen? Good, cool. All right, who wants to be brave and go first? Rita. <laughs> okay, I suppose that can be my punishment for being generally quite insufferable. <laughs> oh, Rita, if everybody was as insufferable as you are, I'd actually enjoy my job every day. So, um, but yeah, let's call it that if that's what you need. <laughs> okay. Pick a topic, let's go. I'll take certainty for 20, please. Okay, why not? Given that I've broken the first one. So, certainty for 20. What are the consequences if a court finds an agreement to be void for lack of, insert, uh, lack of certainty? Now, the rest of you, the way that you work out whether or not you're going to get the answer right is not by just thinking it. Write it down somewhere. If you are not brave enough to write it into the chat and share it, I completely understand that. It happens. But I would say do it. Um, and write it into the chat. Yeah, no, well, we're going to get you to talk. Oh, okay, and, great. And if somebody comes up with a better answer, they're writing it down, right? Because you're actively answering. So what do you think? Um, well, I'm thinking that it's probably those two options where you can either excise it from the agreement or the party to whom it will benefit decides to waive it. Okay, good. So can you remember the technical language around that? Um, waiver and um, no, can't remember the other one. Okay, so we call that severance. That's so, and so, so, and the other term that is relevant here is voidable. So a contract could be void for a lack of certainty or it could be voidable where some provision is lack it is lacking in certainty which leads to the question of whether that term can be severed or whether if it only benefits one party that party can waive it so let me just see oh my eyesight needs to be better so the way this works i then have a rough answer i don't remember what they are myself so none of the agreement can be in four oh, typo, don't you hate typos? Can be enforced. So the case is Wickler and Brew. So why I'm just gonna go back one. Um, why we've started off and I've not read the question carefully myself as I've continued on the conversation with Rita there. The question here was quite specific, again, because it's early in the process. Um, quite if a contract finds an agreement to be void, so it wasn't actually talking about a provision, just lacking certainty, what are the consequences of that, which leads to if there's absolutely no certainty, then the contract will be void, which means lock and brew applies. Um, but if the provision itself lacks certainty, then can it be severed? If it's just the provision and the rest of the contract can continue, 
then it can be, the rest of the contract can continue. Or if it can be severed and it only benefits one party, that party can just waive it. So, oh, now I've, boom, let me go back. You've now seen the question for 30. All right, let me look at my table, where you're all sitting on my table here. Uh, okay, why can't I see anything today? Um, I'm just going to stop, stop share for a second so I can see you. Oh, there you are. Lovely. All right. Next person down in a row for me is Craig. Craig, I'm okay. calling. What are you going to do? Would you like to go for certainty for 30 or capacity formalities, privity or wildcard? Wildcard for 10. Wildcard for 10. Man who likes to live dangerously, but not too dangerously. Why must the party show an intention to be bound before their agreement will be enforced? Two typos for Kath. That's not good. Um, I, I can't see the question. but Oh, um, sorry, I'm not sharing it. That would be why. Um, I'm just having one of those days where I can't see my screen terribly well. I think I need new glasses. Uh, let me just do that. And then I need to do this so I can share. I don't know. You guys, you just want everything, don't you? You expect to be able to see a question when I ask it? Sorry about that. So why must the party show, that should say an intention, to be bound before their agreement will be enforced? It's a formal requirement, the contract, so that um, this demonstrates the intention to be legally bound by the agreement and the other clauses within the contract um, to show that it's not a, um, a uh, casual arrangement, that, it's, um, that it has legal standing. But I'm not... Um, uh, I can't really add to that. No, that's all right. So ultimately, it, it is circular in definition, this idea that we're, when we're talking about an agreement in the context of contract law, we are talking about an agreement that the courts will enforce. And before a court will enforce this, and the, you might have used the word private law, this, this um, arrangement that is intended to be a type of law between the parties who have adopted or entered into the contract, then a court wants to see that the intention was that it would be binding. And so one of the reasons that we start off looking at family or social relationships uh, when it comes to intention is that that's a really good example of where people enter into agreements. But if you ever ask them, is it your intention that if somebody um, uh, breaches this agreement that you would end up in the courts over it? And with family and friends, the answer to that is often no. Uh, but similarly, there are lots of circumstances, and particularly in a modern environment, where we know we're not going to sue over $20. It's just not worth doing it. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't expect that the other side will keep their promise. Um, and the only reason we're not suing is because it's financially inefficient to do so. So... Um, Again, are you noticing here one, and I'm not expecting you to be able to do this without notes in front of you, by the way, um, although with some of them you should be getting to the stage where you can now. Um, we're trying to ensure that with every statement we make about what the law is or why the law works in a particular way, we're going to pull out a citation in support. So I'm using the Woolen Mills citation here or reference here. Um, and the other thing that's worth actually noting, so I'm just going to try and find my clicker so I can highlight for you. Um, oh, away. Um, as soon as I touch something, things go wrong. Um, that it's not necessary, particularly in an exam, to give a full citation. Giving something that just gives me the name of a case uh, will be enough for me to know that you know what you're talking about here. So in the case, if you're talking about a particular judgment um, where you, you might, and be, the examples of that would be rare, but you might want to refer to what Kirby said in Woolworths or what, uh, I'm 
just trying to think of another one off the top of my head. We talked about the full court in tramways, the full court in Australian water mills. Um, that helps you in that. So again, I think, Craig, you're pretty much with the full court here. It's of the essence of a contract regarded as a class of obligations that there is a voluntary assumption of a legally enforceable duty. So demonstrating intention shows that voluntary assumption. Questions, concerns, frustrations, disagreements? I, Kath, I re remember that for commercial contracts, isn't it, it's, it's, the, it's the rebuttable presumption the other way where the assumption is that it's is it that right for commercial uh, yeah. contracts? Uh, so in um in relation to intention and um, we don't have intention here it might turn up um in intention there is it's of fairly limited value these days since homogeneous but there is a the starting point is a rebuttable presumption in a commercial relationship that an agreement entered into between commercial parties will be intended to be binding. So the onus is on the person who wishes to demonstrate that that was not the intention to bring the evidence to show that that was not the intention. And the converse of that is that in family and social relationships, there will be a rebuttable and easily rebutted, but a rebuttable presumption that arrangements were not intended to be legally binding, which means the onus is on the person who is seeking to sue on the contract to bring evidence of that intention. Okay, thank you. And you and you just quote Ermogenus there and, and you'll be golden. Okay, now I think that's Scott with his microphone off. Um, and you're next, Scott. Want to pick a question? You can go a wild card for 20, certainty for 30, capacity, formalities or privity. Oh, actually, you might not have a um, microphone from memory. Let me see if you're in the chat saying something to me. No. Scott, you're being very quiet. Oh, I've unmuted you. Can you say anything? No, you're being quiet. I'm going to assume that you don't want to play or it doesn't work, which is fine. But that brings us down to Anna. Want to have a go, Anna? Be brave. You're smart. You can do this. My, my son is with me, but it's okay. <laughs> he actually, he listens to your lecture as well. So oh, yeah, I, yeah I, maybe I share the... Oh. Well, get him to pick. Because he's little, isn't he? Have you got the eight months old with you or the bigger one? Six, six years. Six year old. Hello, um, Mr. Yeah. Six. Okay, let him six choose. Okay. You can choose whatever, get him to choose a color Which that he color likes like? and we'll go with that one. What colour do you like? Orange. Orange. Let's do that one. Wild card for 20. Are you happy with that, Anna? Yes, cool. Cool. Okay. So what does a rebuttable presumption mean? Oh, my God. Um, it's... I do know this question. Is that uh, relates to um, presumption? It's like yeah. Um, the commercial. Just, think that. just just don't panic. You've got yeah, a brain's I... trust here to help you, including I... the one who's picked the colour. <laughs> so just been talking about rebuttable presumptions in the context of intention. So there's a rebuttable presumption that in commercial arrangements that it's a commercial intended to be binding. Oh, really? and oh yes. Uh, if, there's not. So okay. just unpick that terminology. When would you use rebuttable presumption in a sentence? And I think it's particularly good because your helper here is six and everything about the word but is funny when you're six. <laughs> See? You get <laughs> so I'm asking your mum a question about rebut a bull presumption. So let's work out what that means. 
He loves this question. <laughs> hey, you're my future your future class member. I think we need to, to deal with this. So what do we reckon it means? <laughs> okay, stop laughing. Okay. <laughs> what do we think it means? What does bad bone mean? Do you know? No. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here. So basically it comes from Latin. So again, for the rest of you, I know just the fact that it's Latin will make it amusing. Um, and actually I always want to say that as with the word tantrum instead of tantum. Uh, so again, I think that's funny. So a rebuttable presumption is an assumption that the court uses a kind of shorthand. So we're starting on the basis, like I did, that butts are funny. I have a rebuttable presumption that referring to butts is going to make a six-year-old laugh. As it turned out, it worked, right? Yeah. It turned out to be true. Um, but if it hadn't been true, um, in fact, it could be that there's a rebuttable presumption here that everybody else thinks I am ridiculous and that there is nothing funny about the use of the word but in the middle. Let me test that. Are any of the rest of you finding it vaguely amusing? <laughs> ah, Stephen is smiling. So there is, I can rebut the presumption because I have evidence that we would need to bring that somebody who is older than six uh, is clearly also amused by the use of the word but in that sentence. I would like to just point out now that I've just taken my teaching in a place that I never thought I would with you guys. I've just gone um, and it's recorded. So let's just see what happens with this. Is this a time where I need to remind you that you guys really have to do your course experience surveys? Um, and now if you refer to butts, I'll know who it is. Uh, so let's see. Um, probably the most famous rebuttable presumption is innocent until proven guilty. Okay, so again, Mr. Six, you need to think about this. When the biscuits go missing from the pantry, you come up with, you look your mother in the eye and you say, innocent until proven guilty. She needs to find those crumbs she needs to see you with the stomach ache before she knows for sure that you're the one who took them. By the way, I'm not actually, yeah, I am. I'm clearly encouraging theft in your house. Comments, concerns, frustrations? All right. Angelica, you're going to be next. What do you want? Um, uh, Let's go with uh, privity for 10. Privity for 10. What rights does a third party have to enforce contracts made for his or her benefit? Um. Now, and the rest of you throw something in as well. I'm clearly not keeping score. <laughs> um. Is that the one though with that complicated diagram that um, that you drew? Uh, well, I mean, on the face of it, third parties don't have rights to enforce a contract unless they're privy to that contract, that they're, they're a party to it. That is true. That uh, is a really good start. But if um, if the part, what is that? Oh, sorry, let's look at my notes. Um, I'm sorry, you are doing awesome here, isn't she? Uh -huh. Um, okay, hold on. Um, oh my god. It, it, it was that case with the. Um, Anybody else want to help her out here? I can see a couple of you put some words the down. The paint. The paint case. Yeah, that's the one. Ethel and Shanklin Pier. So that is one <laughs> way. So, But I think where you started was right. So again, be confident. <laughs> confident here you have started in the right place <laughs> the short answer is if you are not privy to a contract then you cannot sue or be sued on that contract yeah so let me go to the answer i've overcomplicated my slide pack so no rights to enforce the contract because and the language that we use is that you're a stranger to the contract so you have no rights under it 
but there are a couple of things that you could do. So, and again, a good example of this was, for some reason I'm remembering that the discussion board question involved one of the parties was Judy. So Judy entered into a contract in Queensland for a young person, I think they might've been, it might've been her child to uh, rent a house when they went to university was the question. And it was one of the ones where a lot of people went straight into the capacity problem because the accommodation was substandard. And so the question that was placed was, could the kids sue under the contract? And everybody went straight on that, not everybody, but a lot of people went straight to the, quest, the capacity question. No, he's too young. And then actually, well, he wasn't even a party to the contract. So if the uh, accommodation is substandard, even though he is the one enjoying the benefits of the contract, he's the one who's actually occupying the premises, all he really has to do is ring Judy and say, it's not good enough. Let's, can you complain? Can you exercise your rights under the contract? It's often as simple as that, just getting the person who is it to take action. We also need to usually, depending on the facts, unpick whether or not the person really is a party to the contract or not, because the person who entered the contract might have done so as their agent. Um, and then the, the, it's more complicated to do, but the question sometimes becomes, can the person who is aggrieved sue under a collateral contract? Uh, and that's why I use Shanklin and Shanklin Peer and Dettel. Um, and I like using that example because that's one where the collateral uh, contract can be sued under. The one that's in our textbook to point to what a collateral contract is, is the Hoyts example. And in fact, that fell over. It couldn't be used. Can anybody for extra points remember why the Hoyts case, there was no collateral contract? We're just doing revision here. Come on, Craig, I know you want to. No, I can't remember it. Popcorn? Popcorn. Popcorn. Popcorn's a good answer. Slip that in with a hashtag and I'll give you an extra point somewhere along the way, I'm sure. Out of it like a million. Um, the reason in that case that it couldn't be found is that if there was a, in order for there to be a collateral contract, it needs to be consistent with the main contract. And so in the Hoyts example, um, the promise that they were claiming would be breached in the collateral contract was a promise that the landlord would only exercise the rights uh, to kick the tenant out if uh, the head lessor kicked them out. And so they were arguing that there was a collateral promise, the promise that induced the contract, that they would only exercise this right in limited circumstances. But the court said, well, but that's ridiculous because that is inconsistent with what the contract itself said. Where in Dettel, the promise that the paint was of sufficient quality to, res to be appropriate for use on a pier induced Shanklin Pier to specify that paint when the, uh, in its tender. So then people uh, tended to paint the pier using a particular paint. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? Paint the pier using a particular paint. And, um, and so that's consistent with the promise that the paint would be of a particular quality. I'm so glad I didn't slip up saying any of those words. Awesome. Questions, concerns? I will go back. Okay, Steve, I think you're next. What are you looking for? I'm scared. Uh, Good, be afraid. Capacity for 10. I'm not very capacity brave. Capacity for 10. What are the tests for determining whether something is a necessary? Oh, God. Uh, Actually, I, I'm going to let you keep going, but prayer is not one of them. Okay. Thank you. Um, think think about it. Now, oh, okay, okay. In, in terms of... Uh, so, so, go, I'm thinking in terms of young, you know, the things that come to my mind, less than 18 and necessaries are the items that they need to sustain themselves. So, 
Okay, that's a, draw that thought out. Does every we're talking about kids? Yeah. So are uh, the things that they need for their to sustain themselves are things that are necessary for every kid the same? No, they they won't ne necessary for that individual. So different people obviously different needs. Um, so can you remember the um, the expression that the common law uses that you see in the cases? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Station in life. Uh, yeah. So we have de determined that a necessary for Mr. Six, who's joined our classroom, is butt jokes. <laughs> um, but a necessary for a, you have a 13 year old, I know, um, a necessary for a 13 year old might be a Spotify account. Um, they will be different things for different kids depending on what their station in life is. So, is it so? And there are two parts of the test. Sorry, I went part to the second part. Is is it capable of being a necessary? Which goes to is it actually something that they need for their education, to for their shelter, <coughs> food, uh, to keep them well clothed, or is it something outside of that? Um, and can it be properly regarded as necessary for that particular minor, taking into account and set very old fashioned language, station in life. Mm -hmm. So the case that I quoted, which I've now forgotten, and I quoted it incorrectly in the uh, class, I relied on my memory, which was a bad thing, but there was, um, it involved a young man who was going to Cambridge and rumor went around town that I think I said they were linen shirts, but it turned out they were waistcoats, I think. Maybe it's the other way around now, I've forgotten. Um, but a tailor basically had heard the rumour that this kid could be talked into buying anything and so basically fitted him out with 13 shirts or something like that when he actually... Uh, and the court basically said, yeah, well, one, maybe, two even, but nobody needs 13. So he'd been ripped off. Okay, what about you, Sigrid? Where are you going? Are uh, you muted still? Let me, I can unmute you, I think. Here we go. Yep. Uh, formalities for 10. Oh, you're all shy this time. I know. Huh? But you've also worked out I'm not keeping count, but I'm sure you are. Okay, here you go. This is great for you as one of our people who has to do this in a second language. Have a go at seeing if you can play in English, section 26 of the Instrument Act. Oh, God. Um, now, do you remember what this provision's about? Yes, I'm just... Just having a look. Okay, sorry, I'll stop interrupting you. <laughs> Have a go when you're ready. I think it has to do with the fact that, because um, I was reading about it today, Section 20 of the Instrument Act, that... Um, I actually think that might be a typo too. Again, three typos I've noticed. I think that should be Section 126 of the Instrument Act. I'm thinking... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you a point if, if you can confirm that for me. Uh, And here I am marking papers for you guys and picking up typos left, right and centre that you'll think make me look very anal. And then you see things like this. I need to apologise. I actually think I've picked up, I've, I've opened the earlier version of this. I, I've got a memory of going through and fixing up typos. Maybe there are just more. Anyway, so what's what's 126 of the Instrument Act about? Why why is it relevant? What are we talking about? Um, that agreements need to be in writing. For an, an agreement to be valid, it needs to be in writing. It can't be a... That's um, exactly where it comes from. So it's right in the formality space. But it, clearly it's not every agreement. What kind of agreements? An, an agreement for the sale of land. Okay. Anything else? Um. So Craig's noted here that actions 
can be brought uh, about guarantees, sale of land, debt default when the agreement is in writing. And Stephen's saying first part means you can't sue. Anna's added in door-to-door -door sales, which is absolutely correct, but not as a consequence of this clause. That comes from the Competition and Consumer Act, the clause I can't remember, but it's another example of a similar section in a piece of legislation that has this effect. Now, look, I won't, won't drag it out. Let's have a look. In fact, rather, why don't I do it with the language in front of you and then we'll just have a look at it. I'm, and I won't do this perfectly because it's very difficult clause or provision to read. So an action must not be brought means you can't sue. So brought to charge a person. So you can't sue a person for their promise to pay a debt or to answer for the default or miscarriage that of a debt that other people sorry now i've got it confusing okay i'm going to use my i'm going to use my little dancing ball to get us here you can't sue a person for their promise to answer for the debt default or miscarriage which is in other words is to meet their obligations under a guarantee or mm. under a contract for the sale or the creation of any kind of interest in land unless the guarantee or agreement on which, for the sale of land on which the suit would be brought or a memorandum or note of that agreement is in writing that's been signed by the person you want to sue or by a person who's been lawfully authorised in writing by the person you want to sue to sign the agreement memorandum or note. Even then, I didn't really plain it, did I? Because no. I used the same thing. So if we were really going to reduce it into plain English, it would go something along the lines of, unless a person who is giving a guarantee or is trying to buy or sell or otherwise create an interest in land has done so given the guarantee or entered into the contract relating to the land in writing and signed that contract themselves or has ensured that an agent that they have authorised in writing has signed it, you cannot sue that person. Even again, it's, it's not easy to play language. So what have I done here? You can't commence an action in a court to recover money from someone who is given a guarantee or in respect to a contract that relates to land unless the guarantee or the contract is in writing that's been signed by the party you want to sue or their agent or there is a memorandum or note of the agreement which has also been signed. If the document is signed by an agent, the agent must have been appointed in writing as well. Now, I'm not going to make you plain English anything in an exam, by the way. Don't be petrified. What's actually important here is you understand what that provision means. And one of the best ways to understand it is to try and make sense of it, I think. Okay, Rita, I'm coming back to you. We've only got 10 minutes left, so only a couple of you are going to get another go. Um, oh, right. Certainty for 50. Certainty for 50? We're going right to the end. I'm not, I don't know that's the rules, but hey, why not? Because this is revision. I'm going to make this slide pack available to you. They're just more questions and answers, my friends. So let's just do this. Whitlock and Brood. It was impossible to identify what such reasonable provisions as may usually be found in such a lease meant because of the unique commercial situation. However, in Godeke and Kerwin, Justice Walsh read the requirement that an additional terms to be included by solicitors was limited to terms consistent with the commercial agreement and found reasonable terms in an objective sense. This is consistent with the idea, oh, it's gone to an answer. That's annoying. What's going on? I'm just, I'm thinking, I'm waiting for the question to come up. I'm happy to see the question now. The question now is <laughs> contrast the decision in Godeke and Kerwin with Whitlock and Brew. Let's just talk about that. I know. <laughs> there you go. 
know. I'm definitely somehow pulled down an earlier version of my... Don't you think this is an awesome PowerPoint? Like, how cool is this that you can jump around and do everything? Oh, cool. It's not like I'm not doing anything for you, but clearly it didn't always work. Um, so we don't do many of these, and I can tell you from, from knowledge that in none of the exams at the moment is there a, commit, a, a, a contrast the two cases, but it is good in your... Uh, basket of tricks in an exam to be aware of cases that are similar but different from each other so you can bring them out as examples of where there might be some nuance or some sophistication uh, so good examples of that are like the um, ANI case and the MMC case where we've got two very similar sets of facts that go to the question of letters of comfort um, and so when you can contrast the differences and similarities, that shows that you're thinking. And at the end of the day, an exam, unlike assignments, where when you're doing the assignment, you're learning something new, in an exam, what we're looking for is what do you know? What do you understand? How can you shine? How can you tell us something that we don't already know? Um, so sorry about that. Okay, I'm quite fine with that. <laughs> Good. All right, Craig, I'm making you next. Pick another one. Let's see if we get a similar issue. Sorry about that. Wild, wild card, card, any one of the wild cards. Any of the wild cards, which one? 30, 40 or 50? 30. What potential problems are involved in making an apparently oh, serious offer as a practical joke? Um, that uh, the offer can be uh, accepted as a serious offer and um, if that's not your intention your intention is to joke then um, you uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you'd phrase it legally but um, you've uh, potentially defrauded the other person not, yeah, well not, even if we just think about it from the point of view of intention if your intention was that you were making a joke. So, so the assessment now, would be... It seriously, how would a court decide the question of intention? Would, they, would, they would look for an objective um, test. So they would put a reasonable person that knows the uh, external facts and they would judge what that person would think has gone on Absolutely. rather than what has happened internally for the person. Absolutely. So actually in this very ancient case, they, this actually happened. It's also referred to in one of the intention cases we dealt with. I thought I would have had a note on it here, but I can't remember which one off the top of my head. But unless the joke would be apparent to a reasonable person, the joker might find themselves in a contract that they didn't intend to because the test for intention is objective, not subjective. So it might be when I make jokes, I hope, about things that you can do in exchange for an HD, I think it's pretty clear that I am joking and that an objective test would demonstrate uh, that I am making a joke. And the reasonable person test, it doesn't necessarily mean in isolation that it will and we've seen a couple of examples of this where a test has been applied and it said, so Balmain Ferry is a good example of that, uh, where in the Balmain Ferry case, the solicitor, I can't remember his name, Robinson, um, the court said, you go to that pier every day. <laughs> so you know that the sign's there, you know how it works. It's a penny every time you go through the turnstile, whether you go on the ferry or not. Um, so the re even though it's still an objective test, it was an objective test on the basis of somebody who'd been there every day. Similarly, in Thornton and Shoe Lane parking, um, the objective test was applied, but on the basis of somebody who'd never been there before. And that result might have been different if um, Mr Thornton had parked in the Shoe Lane parking station regularly. So, again, it's just really about the test. So will we do one more before we go our separate ways for the weekend or is there other questions, concerns, frustrations? 
even compliments. You can share some love if you like that you would rather move on to. Compliments. I, I think this is really cool, Kath. I like this. I just wish we had more time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm home alone today, so I can't actually give you more time tonight. I'm, um, no, no, that's no. I'm just saying, as a as a learn as a learning tool, it really works. I like it. Well, do you know what you can do? And I'm perfectly happy. Uh, you know, I think you should. Uh, at some point, these I, I'll make sure that this um, pack is available when I upload the video of this. But why don't you find your study group and play this as a game? Hmm. Okay, you know you can do this one even better. Um, another game that I sometimes have played in shoots when we've had time, and I'm happy to do it in um, as we're leading up. Is I like to uh, play a little game which I say is write the question. So I think I understand the traditional view of Jeopardy is, in fact, you're supposed to start with, you have an answer and you're supposed to come up with a question. But one of the things that I like to do is actually just use people, all of you write a question that you think you know the answer to. Um, and if you've got a question that stumps someone else, but you can articulate what the answer is without being mean, you know, like that's something that's as part of this, and if you've got a question and you can articulate the answer, your side wins a point. Um, but if they can point out that your answer is wrong or that you've um, missed a case or something like that, they get a point. You can do your own Q&A as you go here. And often it's the activity of thinking about the questions will help. And that can be a good way to go through some of the questions in the past exams, which are all available to you as well. Um, I think you remember stuff if you have a bit of fun with it. I could be wrong, but I remember stuff better if I have a bit of fun with it. Um, and also you can look at something and believe that you would write a good answer to it. The actual act of stopping and writing down an answer will help you way more than just thinking about the answers. All right, let's do one more before I stop sermonising and we'll head off because I did start a little bit late. Um, who's next on my list? Craig. Oh, no, we just did Craig, didn't we? Um, oh, Angelica, you guys have moved around a little bit. I'm making you. Okay. Um, uh, I did privity last time, so maybe I'll do capacity for 20. Capacity. Sorry. For 20? Yeah. What is a beneficial contract of service? Um, a beneficial contract of service. Um, well, I mean, on the face of it, it's a contract where you're receiving the benefit of that service. So, um, I mean, I mean, it's I'll narrow it for you. If, yeah. if. I am a minor child and I want to enter into a beneficial contract of service. Can you give me an example of what that might look like? Um, like an apprenticeship? Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So the idea of a beneficial contract of service is that it's an employment contract where the minor is employed, but they don't only get employment they get some sort of education and uh, they're offered some additional self-support. Yeah. So, and again, the cases that we looked at, so um, in fact, we're always using cases where it's not a beneficial contract of service. So the two key ones we looked at were the Barnum Circus one, uh, Barnum and somebody else, where effectively there was a suit being brought against one circus or entertainment company by another saying that you have induced a breach of contract. So the action was actually being brought in tort. Uh, and so the question became whether or not there was a contract that the minor could breach. And in that particular case, because the terms were so onerous and the minor only got paid when she was working and she wasn't guaranteed work, she wasn't getting any education, they found that there was no beneficial contract of service. So therefore, because she was a minor, there was no contract. Therefore, there could be no suit for a tort of inducing a breach of contract. 
Uh, the other more modern one is the Wayne Rooney case between the two agencies that represented him. And the same thing happened, that they found that there was no, the contract that Rooney and his parents entered into related to, uh, you know, a sports agency. They were basically getting him photography deals and things like that. He wasn't learning anything from that. Uh, it wasn't a necessary for him. Uh, there was no contract and therefore there could be no tort for inducing a breach of contract. Oops. Okay, sorry, I've just got, oh, I didn't know I could just hit escape, close my thing and come back to you all. Um, oh, I had a nap this afternoon and you can tell it from my hair. Um, I'm finally getting better though. <laughs> Any concerns, questions? Um, where do you find past exams? I can see that question. Uh, in Canvas, in the week 12 materials, you will find down the bottom there in, so the, the week that we're going into, they will include a package of some past exams. I am going to put up the most relevant past exam from structure point of view is the most recent one, which was last semester, and they are not up yet. So I will do that after I have some dinner tonight. So they'll be there for you tomorrow. And in class tomorrow, I will be going through uh, what the exam will look like, how I'm going to be marking it in broad sense, some exam strategies and techniques, uh, and then more revision questions, not dissimilar to the sort of things that we've been doing today. Um, different PowerPoint, more pop, pop culture. All right. Thank you. Okay, Thank guys, you. have a lovely evening. I will see many of you in class tomorrow. The rest of you will get to hear my dulcet tones not all that long afterwards. Um, I realised today that I, I got the videos and everything up um, very quickly, but I had to present at a conference and I think I forgot to send an announcement. Um, I remember ticking the box that meant that Canvas should tell you the recordings were there. Um, and nobody contacted me saying, where are the recordings? But just in case, um, I just want to apologise for that because I usually send out an announcement and I, I think just because I was nervous about presenting at the conference and I'm not well, um, I just didn't do it. So, mea culpa. Um, well, I did. You, I got, you got it? Oh, maybe I sent an announcement and I forgot, but I think it, you just got a notification when they went up. The notifications that they were available. Good, good. I'm sort of assuming that's enough. Then the other thing for the OUA guys, your time is past, but I am getting daily notifications that only 10 people in my class of 30 something face-to-face -face classes have submitted a course experience survey. Uh, and usually the people who submit are the people who really hate the course or really love the course. So if you're either of those people, the only way action will be taken, positive or negative, is if you submit. And if you are neither of those, the only way that it can get better again from something that so far is pretty ho-hum for you is if you provide robust and actionable feedback the kind of robust and actionable feedback that I suspect you want me to give you. Speaking of which, um, I'm surprised nobody has been asking me yet, where are the, is the feedback on your most recent assignments? Uh, the short answer is I haven't finished marking them all yet. Uh, and we do also have um, a couple of special cases for some special consideration, which I believe will be resolved by Wednesday this week, so I can't actually re re reduce. I can't actually share feedback with you until we have all submissions, even if they're not all marked. So um, the earliest date you're going to get them is Wednesday, uh, and hopefully it will be Wednesday. I just can't promise. I ha actually haven't finished marking them yet, so I don't. I certainly don't want you to think I'm blaming anybody who's got special consideration. That is the furthest thing from what I am trying to do. I'm just, no, I'm just aware that as I've been struggling because I haven't been well, 
to get them finished that I couldn't release them until Wednesday anyway. So I really hope that didn't come out the wrong way because any of your colleagues who are struggling in that way, they've got bloody good reasons for it, let me tell you. It, it just sounded like full disclosure. It's all about full disclosure with me. Speaking of which, just me and the kid home tonight, so I think I've got to find out what we're going to have for dinner. Um, I think he wants to go to the pub, and I'm fairly keen on that as well. So on that note, have a lovely night, everybody. And, you know, we are almost there. Can you believe it? Like 11 weeks ago, we didn't even know each other. Went fast. Yeah. Exactly. All things shall pass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And by the way, because um, I've been unwell, today I read Margaret Atwood's new book. And any of you who have read or watched The Handmaid's Tale, you want to read the new one. It's like, it's really good. Really good. But, I, oh, that's right, you have an exam. But you do need to, like, have a bigger life. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Thank you. See you later. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Six, for coming and joining us. Bye. Bye. Bye.